you have. Yeah. Um, so today we are really excited to have uh, Gautam Kamas. Um, so Dr. Gautam Kamas is an assistant professor at University of Waterloo and a faculty affiliate at the Vector Institute. He has a BS in computer science and electrical and computer engineering from Cornell University and a master's and a PhD in computer science from MIT. His research interests lie in methods for statistics and machine learning with a focus on challenges related to trustworthy machine learning, including data privacy and robustness. He was a Microsoft Research Fellow and a recipient of an NSERC Discovery Accelerator Supplement. He was awarded the Best Student Presentation Award at the ACM Symposium on Theory of Computing in 2012. So without further ado, let's welcome Gautam. Thanks so much for the introduction, Went Long. Uh, let me share uh, screen. And also uh, thank you to Kalpesh for the uh, invitation and all of you for being here as well. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about differentially private fine tuning of language models. This is uh, to appear in iClear 2022 this year. Uh, and it's a joint work with a huge uh, list of co-authors who are all excellent. Let me just list them. There's Dayu, Sarab Naik, uh, Artur Bachkur, Sivakant Gopi, Hussein Inan, Janarlan Kulkarni, Yintad Lee, Andre Manuel, Lucas uh, Wachitz, uh, Sergei Yakanin, and Huishe Zhang. This is a huge collaboration. I guess one of the few like amazing things about the pandemic is I was able to collaborate with all these amazing folks over three different continents, uh, North America, Europe, as well as uh, uh, Asia. So they're mostly at Microsoft. Uh, Dai Yu was an intern at Microsoft, uh, who's at Sun Yat Sen, and uh, Yin Tad is a professor at University of Washington, but everyone else at Microsoft. So yeah, uh, anyway, uh, in terms of the focus of today's talk, I'm going to tell you about you know, how we can use differential privacy to privately fine tune uh, language models. And I want to leave this as a very uh, open talk in the sense that if you have any questions, if anything's unclear, it's probably not going to be super, super long. So uh, feel free to ask if anything's unclear. Uh, I know that DP is new to some of you, but also we have a number of uh, experts at UMass Amherst as well. So as a motivation for this talk, let me start by showing you uh, this comic. Uh, it turns out that uh, reality resembles uh, this as well. But here you can see this comic from XKCD, where you can see the user has entered into uh, maybe their email or something saying, long live the revolution, our next meeting will be at. And then they ask uh, Gmail or something to tell them, how do we complete the sentence? And then you can see it reveals the docs at midnight on June 28th. So somehow it leaked some information from someone else's emails. It's the idea or the joke behind this. So yeah, this is just a joke, right? But uh, actually, no. It turns out that such types of uh, machine learning uh, vulnerabilities and uh, data privacy leakages are actually more real than uh, this comic might suggest. In particular, let me tell you about one work, first of all, by Carlini, Liu, Erlingson, Kosa, and Song. Uh, in this experiment, what they did was they trained an LSTM or an RNN. And what they did was they added a canary phrase to the training data, perhaps multiple times. So for example, what I mean by a canary phrase is, uh, if you've heard the ter term canary in a coal mine, uh, it's a reference to that. But uh, for example, suppose you add the phrase to your training data, the random number is 28126517. And say you add this, say, like 10 times to your uh, training data set. Now, if you do that during training time, then during inference or prediction time, then you can show that it, is, it has been empirically observed that canary phrases will have lower log perplexity. So in particular, if I consider a bunch of phrases of the form and the random number is uh, something, then you'll see that the lowest log perplexity and therefore kind of the highest probability assigned to a sequence, the highest likelihood, is going to correspond to exactly that random number uh, that we put in. Uh, and you can see that the things that are uh, lower and lower as they go, uh, you can see the highest likelihood ones still closely resemble this uh, so-called random number. So kind of what this is saying is that if you train uh, the, if you train your model on some data set, then the output will in some sense uh, resemble that uh, training data. And in fact, to the point of even memorization in some sense. Now you might not think this is th that bad, like a random number is whatever, but this could actually be pretty bad if, for example, we're talking about my social security number is blah. So this seems some sort of vulnerability in which the model is leaking information about the training set. Now you might be thinking, okay, this is just LSTMs, LSTMs, who use LSTMs anymore? Uh, this is the old fashioned uh, 
you know, get out of here, old man. But it's not just LSTMs. Uh, let me tell you about, uh, there's also another paper also by Carlini et al with uh, another set of co-authors. Um, and they found that GPT-2 is as well. And here's a passage from a blog post by some of the authors. So what they did was they focused on GPT-2 and tried to see similar things as it memorizing its training data. And in fact, they found that at least 0.1% of its text generations uh, contains long verbatim strings that are copy pasted from a document in its training set. Uh, and this can include things like personal information or copyrighted content. Uh, here is kind of the figure from their paper, uh, which shows that if you feed in GPT-2, if you give it some prefix East Stroudsburg Stroudsburg, then GPT-2 will output verbatim someone's personal information. This is the, this is redacted by the author's paper, but not you know draw too much attention to this individual. But essentially, it'll tell you some individual's uh, email address, their phone number, their fax number, their name, etc. So it seems like if you put any personal information into training a language model, then it might just spit it out. And also copyrighted content is a problem as well. Here's another passage from this uh, blog post, uh, which I mentioned. Uh, they prompted GPT-3 with the beginning of chapter three of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, obviously a copyrighted uh, book. And the model correctly reproduces about one full page of the book before making its first mistake, 240 words in a row without any mistakes. So it seems like this is kind of the common theme that, just to summarize what we said so far, the common theme is that language models seem to be susceptible or prone to memorizing their training data, which may be sensitive, and they can spit it out almost verbatim or exactly verbatim, which is a privacy concern. So now the question is, is there any solution for this? How do we deal with this? Uh, are we doomed? And here is a passage from the previous uh, Carly Dale. They tried a bunch of different approaches to try to get rid of this phenomenon. Things like, you know, you might think this is a type of overfitting. So maybe early stopping or dropout or other type of regularization methods, those might work. And they showed, no, this isn't good enough. These don't work. These types of regularization are insufficient. And the only solution they were able to uh, find is using differentially private training uh, techniques. They were able to eliminate the issue completely. So that's cool, that's amazing. We found a way to solve it, uh, but there's one big question, what is differential privacy and how does it work? And what is this, albeit at some loss in utility? How bad is that loss in utility? And that's kind of like what, what this uh, today's talk is going to be kind of focusing on, uh, trying to understand how much loss in utility and whether we can surmount that. So I'm going to tell you what is differential privacy. It's a definition due to Dwork, McSherry, and Asim Smith. This should be familiar to some of you. Uh, I, I hope, like, we're not going to focus too much, too, too much on the specific privacy definition. I'm going to maybe just uh, tell you about it. Uh, and then for the rest of the talk, you can just think of it as a black box in the sense uh, that it's, uh, it's, just a, it's just a privacy notion that we're using, which is good. So you can kind of black box it away. But uh, I hope uh, at least some of you are able to learn what differential privacy is if you haven't seen it before. So let me try to first describe what differential privacy is as a type of game or what the objective is, and then I'll write the math, uh, which kind of formalizes that. So the idea is that we imagine that there's some data set which is fed into a training algorithm, and that training algorithm produces some trained model. And an adversary has to look at this trained model that is produced and maybe probe it, inspect it, look at its weights, maybe ask it queries. And the idea is that uh, the adversary, based on looking at this train model, is trying to determine whether the input that was fed into this training algorithm was either this data set X or this data set X prime, which you can see is identical to X, except it has the addition of, say, one additional data point. So the idea is they're trying to figure out which one it was, X or X prime, and uh, distinguish the two cases. Now, an algorithm is said to be differentially private if based on looking at this trained model, they are unable to get significant advantage over just randomly guessing between trying to predict whether it's X or X prime. So in other words, the adversary based on the trained model can't tell if it's with X or X prime. And if they can't tell which of these two data sets it was that was fed into the model, then they have no idea and they can't really say anything about your specific data point if it was in the data set. That's kind of the intuition of what's going on and why it's a good privacy notion. Again, just to repeat that, they can't even tell if a specific point is in the data set, uh, much less what any information about it is. Cool. So a little bit more formally, this definition can be a little intimidating if you haven't seen it before, but don't stress it too much, like I said. Uh, and we say that an algorithm M is differentially private 
And we parameterize differential privacy in terms of two uh, parameters, epsilon and delta. But we say an algorithm is differentially private if for all inputs x and x prime, which differ on one entry, so you can think x and x prime, they differ in one entry here. We have the following property that for all events, which are in the sort of range of the algorithm, we have that the probability of uh, that event occurring under x and x prime is relatively similar. Um, and if I, I put something a little bit like squiggle equals here, but if you want to do it, you have uh, e to the epsilon times this probability plus some delta. So this is like a multiplicative guarantee plus some delta, some additive guarantee. So again, uh, this is a little bit, uh, you know, and what should you think of epsilon? Just, just in case you're curious, what are epsilon and delta? Just think of epsilon as being a small constant, maybe like one, two, three or something, whereas delta is going to be something very, very small, like 10 to the minus five. So, but this, this is maybe a bit too much detail. And I said, I don't want you to worry about it too much. Just think about differential privacy in terms of like the story I told you. And uh, uh, yeah, it essentially, it, yeah, the, the story I told you, I think is clear enough, a quantitative notion of data privacy, which has kind of withstood the test of time and is very popular nowadays. Um, are there questions about this definition before I continue? I'll continue next and tell you some like properties of this definition, but uh, I just want to pause here to make sure uh, you can clear up any misconceptions. Maybe you're going to come to this, but like if you're training a language model, like a data point is a document or like a sentence, or you define that, or yeah, yeah, it's, I think there's different definitions of what people consider, and that's that, that's a very good question. How granular is your privacy concern, and that that can vary from case to case. But yeah, I guess like we're going to roughly consider if for standard data sets, I think like they generally consider a sentence to be uh, like uh, to be an example. For example, like uh, some of these things. Uh, one, one example is like, uh, I guess, MNLI or something, which is where you kind of have a couple of sentences and you have to decide whether they sort of imply each other or if they're consistent or if they contradict each other. Uh, so it's essentially one data point would be one example of that. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you, sense. Yeah, you can think of like a sentence or two. Yeah, like a sentence. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, but great question. And that's a lot of like grant, like people sometimes define user level DP or item level DP, which uh, is kind of a weird misnomer because, you know, it's just a definition and it just depends what you want to consider data point to be. Cool. Any other questions before I continue? All right, great. Let me, again, if this definition doesn't make too much sense, don't worry about it too much. Just consider it as a reasonable privacy notion. And let me tell you some properties of it. Uh, I guess I already told you that. And like I said, if a trained model is differentially private, this implies that it can't depend too heavily on any particular training data point, which is kind of crucial to this type of, uh, of non-memorization property that we're looking for, amongst other things. Oh yeah, let me say that it, uh, it, it pretend, oh, sorry, prevents against uh, this type of memorization, but also a lot of other attacks, so it's more general than uh, that specific privacy violation I mentioned. Uh, and it, it, intuitively, you can say the model is pretty much the same as if your data point was never trained on. And a final comment I'll say is that this is actually compatible with learning in the sense that imagine you have infinite amounts of data, uh, then your learning should be independent of the data set. It, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't really depend too much on its learning patterns rather than individual uh, data points or anything. So yeah, it should be uh, fine. In the end. Um, okay, but uh, the problem comes up with finite amounts of data. All right, so far I've defined, I told you about the definition of differential privacy, but what I wanna tell you is like, how do we actually achieve differential privacy? We need an algorithm which is differentially private. And for machine learning context, there's exactly one, okay, not, not exactly one, there's other algorithms too, but there's one primary algorithm which is popular, which is known as differentially private stochastic gradient descent. Uh, yeah, or DPSGD as it's sometimes called. So first of all, let me tell you what SGD is, which is, should be familiar, and I'll fill in the blanks then. So what SGD is, non-privately, is first we draw a mini batch of data points, we compute their gradients, we average their gradients, and then we take a step and repeat. So this hopefully, one, two, four, six, seven, this should be very familiar to you as like stochastic gradient descent. If this is not private, but the very, very convenient thing, which is I think part of what's fueling a uh, private machine learning in practice is the fact that it's very, very easy to com 
can like okay it's not super there, there's some tricks but uh some challenges but like just in terms of the description uh to make this private is very easy in the sense that what first thing we do is we can we have to clip the exam for example gradients to an l2 ball in other words if you have one gradient which is way way too big then we're going to clip it down so this is all often used for other things in machine learning to prevent things like exploding gradients, et cetera, but we're gonna do similar gradient clipping uh, operation. And the other thing we're going to do is after we do the averaging, we add some Gaussian noise. So this is kind of intuitive. If you want to hide the contribution of any one data point, every, any single gradient, uh, you know, noising it is a pretty reasonable thing to do. So that's it. It's essentially stochastic gradient descent, except you do clipping, as well as noising of the gradients. And that's it. It's very, very easy to plug in to anywhere that you would use SGD essentially. Some caveats, which we'll get to, but uh, yeah, it's at least conceptually simple. So that's the algorithm that we're going to use and consider. Now, what's the catch here? Why, why you know, I told you a private algorithm. Okay, so the problem solved, we'll just use it. Um, but it's not that simple for a few different reasons. The first catch is accuracy. Accuracy is typically a big pain point in differentially private machine learning. And I'm going to show you one figure, which is from an excellent paper of Tremere and Bonnet, which is an iClear 2021. So this, what this chart shows is it shows, uh, you know, the data set CIFAR 10, you, many of you are probably familiar with this. It's a simple image classification task. And they consider privacy at a bunch of different values of epsilon. Uh, we're not gonna, but let, let's just, we're not gonna worry too much about like the distinctions between these epsilons. But I just want to highlight the fact that the state of the art here on doing CIFAR 10, kind of baby's, not baby's first uh, machine learning task uh, in image classification, but maybe baby's second task. Uh, this is supposed to be relatively easy. And we can see the state of the art is 69%. This is, I think, you know, if you ask anyone who does computer vision, embarrassingly bad in the sense that if you don't consider privacy, the state of the art is something like 98%, 99%. We can essentially do the entire uh, data set without, without issue. So yeah. Uh, this 30% this loss of accuracy is essentially unusable. It, it totally destroyed a, a lot of the signal in our, uh, in our uh, model. And so this is, this is actually like a reasonably mature result in the sense that uh, you know, people really started working on earnest in, on like private machine learning in maybe like 2015 or so. Uh, but this, this work is six years later and we're still only getting 70% on kind of like the first, one of the first data sets. So it seems like you know, this, this is not something that's deployment ready for this task in particular. So that's one catch. Another catch is also that there's a significant overhead in terms of resource usage, in terms of the time and space used uh, necessary for uh, DPSGD. And here's the work we had at uh, NeurIPS with two excellent students, Pranav Subramanian and Nick Badivalu. Uh, and we found, and I, I mean, this was, we, we documented the fact that slowdowns can be as large as two orders of magnitude. Uh, where if you take a look at the non-private costs at the uh, bottom, you can see that things are pretty fast, you know, using TensorFlow or PyTorch, you can get things which are quite fast in terms of the median runtime per epoch on some LSTM. But if you look at the private setting, uh, in essentially some of the overheads are as big as two orders of magnitude. You can see that. Uh, so th these ones, they look this big, but they're actually off the chart by like four or five times. So uh, the one exception is the, very, is the recently emerging uh, framework known as JAX, but it seems to be reasonably fast. But in general, it seems like there's a lot of slowdown in terms of the runtime required for DPSGD. And additionally, there's much higher memory usage. So this chart displays the uh, the maximum batch size that can be handled for each of these data sets on some network uh, under uh, without privacy and with privacy. So you can see the top ones are uh, without privacy and the bottom ones are with privacy. And you can see that the max batch size we can handle before running out of memory is maybe like, I don't know, in some cases from say two times uh, more without privacy or five times more to sometimes like, again, from 10 to 10,000, a thousand times uh, more depending on which framework you're using. So yeah, just to sort of summarize that, privacy often costs a lot in terms of accuracy and also has very big resource overheads. So, okay, that, that's kind of the, what I want you to have in mind so far about the state of differentially private machine learning. It's, it's costly in terms of uh, utility and big resource overheads. Okay, I see there's a question in uh, chat. Uh, maybe I missed it, but why is there a higher memory usage? Uh, there's, I guess, a few different reasons. Kind of, uh, I, I guess one of the big reasons for this like kind of overheads uh, is really that classic 
uh, it, it really goes back to that, um, what's it called, that per example clipping operation. This is something which is not well supported on more classic frameworks such as TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch. There is, they're doing things which, uh, which can handle these sorts of things better. But say JAX is, it, it kind of has a very, at a low level property, things known as a, a VMAP, which is vectorized mapping. This operation sort of natively supports things that do, for example, clipping, which is very uh, much more efficient in terms of both time and space for, uh, for um, yeah, privacy. So yeah, that's kind of what I would say the big, uh, the big uh, drawback is. But I'd say also, uh, I guess this was in Europe, we did the work about a year earlier, I'd say that uh, devs of the TensorFlow privacy as well as Opicus, which is the PyTorch privacy package, uh, they're, they're making some big improvements in terms of uh, working on the performance. It's just that thing, people didn't really need these things before. So from an engineering and, uh, and low level perspective, I think these things are getting better. Good, great question though. Um, cool. So I'm going to take a little bit of, now that I've told you about differences with private type machine learning, I'm going to take a little bit of a, a detour or tell you about something a bit different, which may be familiar to more of you, uh, I guess if it's a machine learning talk, um, and that is large language models, which I'm sure uh, every all of you have seen this picture before. Um, this is what's known as a transformer architecture, which is in a paper, a very influential paper, paper by Baswani et al. in 2017. And these uh, are transformer-based large language models have been very influential, uh, things like BERT, GPT, et cetera. Uh, they've, they've really achieved new states of the arts in a state of the arts in a language task, as well as recently being a, in, used in vision as well and lots of other fields uh, also. But generally what I wanna focus on is these things are usually trained and used in a two-step procedure. First of all, they are pre-trained on a very large diverse data set. For example, the training data set for um, some of these models is just you, you literally scrape uh, websites like uh, Reddit outgoing links, uh, Wikipedia, download a whole bunch of books, all of these things, which are very, very, very large, uh, you know, many, many gigs, maybe, maybe even terabytes, I'm not sure. Uh, and, you know, just kind of find all the text you can. And that'll make it kind of learn English in some way. Uh, and then the second thing that we do, the second step is suppose you have a specific task you want to focus on, we would do fine tuning on a smaller task specific data set. Uh, so yeah, that's a two-step procedure about how these things are usually used. And I think this is, I, I framed it like this because I wanted to comment on how convenient this is for differentially private uh, machine learning in the following sense. So you can see the differences in red here. The type, type of framework uh, I want you to picture, which we'll go into more depth on, is we want to picture that the first step when we do it, this pre-training, that's going to be on a large diverse public data set. But then we're going to do fine tuning on a smaller task specific private data set. So let's, let's uh, elaborate on what I mean by that uh, in the sense that the first step is going to be pre-training on a large diverse public data set, uh, which is like I said, just things that you downloaded from the internet, uh, maybe looking at books, et cetera. And like I mentioned, are there, pri uh, there, there may be privacy concerns here and particularly that's kind of what uh, that work by Carlini et al that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk uh, showed. Uh, but the thing is, this is kind of the cat is out of the bag in the sense that these models, GPT-2, uh, GPT-3, uh, I guess GPT-2 only, uh, BERT, these models have been released. Uh, there's kind of no going back with open Pandora's box. Anything that was trained on is now effectively considered public and released. So uh, yeah, whatever was pre-trained on will be uh, public. Uh, I'll mention that there's some work on privately pre-training or on privately, yeah, privately training uh, BERT large by Anil et al. But, uh, that's, that's sort of uh, outside of the scope of today's talk. Uh, instead, what we're going to focus on today is we're going to focus on say fine tuning a small task specific, uh, fine tuning on a specific uh, small task specific private data set, which could be sensitive in many applications. For example, suppose you're a uh, company who wants to do something on your user emails. Well, these are sensitive emails and you don't want to maybe leak information about uh, them. Kind of similar to the XKCD comic we saw at the beginning. Also things like medical data, which are protected by, uh, by laws and stuff. Uh, so yeah, you have to be careful on certain uh, specific smaller uh, task specific data sets uh, and you don't wanna leak information about them. So that's the kind of two-step procedure. And this is part of a broader agenda, which I'll mention again at the end of this talk, which is 
how, when and how much can public data help with private data analysis? Uh, and really starting from scratch is pretty hard and the transfer property could help. Okay, so like uh, I'll, I'll pause here just for a second just to see if everyone's on the same page and uh, ask if there's any questions. Uh, in, in the sense that I want the picture, uh, the picture I want you to have in your head is that we've got a pre-trained model and uh, which is pre-trained on a public data set, but now we're going to fine tune on something which is sensitive and we want to do that privately. So question about this. Uh, so I had a quick question about what you meant by fine tuning here. So in, 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 in NLP, we typically have two definitions of fine tuning. One is language model fine tuning and the second is like a downstream task fine tuning. So um, yeah, I was just wondering whether the fine tuning here is language model training, like it's with the language language modeling objective on private data, or is it um, something downstream like MNLI or SSD or something? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think the latter. I guess I, I I'm not sure about the distinction you're trying to draw. What do you mean by fine tuning the model? The other one? So I mean, it's it, it it's quite common that if you want to like um, like. Like if you want to adapt your language model to a particular domain, you should do a uh, mass language model training or causal language model training on that domain's uh, unlabeled data. And after that, you have a third step where you like fine tune this, um, you, you fine tune this, this model on your on your downstream tasks such as MNLI or SST. So it's, right. yeah. It, it, it's, I, it's, I see it's, what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, sorry, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, no, nothing. I mean, I, I was just wondering like which which type of fine tuning this was. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. Just to so. confirm, I mean like uh, SST or MNLI fine tuning, but I guess you could also consider maybe doing uh, it privately uh, for the other parts as well. Yeah, like really any any phase of this could be in theory in a hypothetically done privately, but we're gonna focus on uh, tuning the weights for say MNLI or something like that. Well, thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, other questions before we continue? Okay, uh, let's proceed. In particular, what are some hiccups? What are the challenges of this type of uh, agenda? Like what, what, why is it not so easy? Uh, the problem is, first of all, that large language models are very large with you know, billions of parameters in some cases, uh, which even in the, in the non-private setting even, this takes significant memory and time to train and store. So it's not very portable in some sense. Uh, and these are even classical challenges without privacy. Classical, I mean, you know, as, as classical as you can be in machine learning for something that was introduced in 2017. But yeah, these are these are classic problems without privacy. And there are even more problems with privacy. So this might be a bit more new to some of you. Uh, in particular, there's a time and memory overheads that I mentioned uh, already as uh, sort of a uh, pain point number two. Uh, and then there's also the fact that sometimes in differential privacy, fewer parameters equal the better, better model. I'm going to put a question mark here just so that you don't take this as uh, the ground truth because uh, I'm going to revisit this in a few. But the fact about differential privacy is if you have a model with P parameters, then the amount of noise you have to introduce to your model in order to privatize it scales with square root of P. Uh, so essentially, the more parameters, the more noise you include. And a common conception before uh, kind of a few years ago was that you kind of have to bottle, ba balance the model ca capacity with the magnitude of noise. So to show you a figure from, uh, this is from this Papper know it all paper, you can see here on the, uh, they, they took some CNN uh, architecture and on the X axis, they have the number of filters at a particular point in their, uh, in their architecture and the Y axis is the test accuracy. So you can see that as you increase the number of filters, so the blue line is privately and the orange line is non-privately, and this is MNIST versus fashion MNIST. So you can see that the non-private uh, accuracy, the orange line on both, increases as you include more filters. The kind of the bigger the model, the better. But you'll see that in the private setting, that as you include more filters, then it becomes better, but then it quickly starts to decay in terms of accuracy. So this is like a very interesting phenomenon that people thought was the case where. You know, sometimes you want to favor smaller models. And since these uh, large language models are so large, then maybe, uh, may maybe you know, they're too big. We can't train it just because we're going to introduce so much noise, uh, you know, since there's square root, uh, since there's with, with billion the parameter, then square root of a billion is still a lot of noise. Oh yeah, and here's also another uh, similar finding in Tremere and Bonnet where they show a parameter, uh, a 168K parameter CNN gets a 60.7, I think on, this is probably uh, CIFAR 10, whereas the bigger one gets 59.2. So, you know, bigger is not always better with privacy. 
So yeah, kind of try, uh, a common theme in many of these hiccups is the fact that more parameters was not necessarily a good thing. And so in the non-private setting, the convenient thing is that uh, there's been a lot of uh, effort into improving this uh, using what's known as parameter efficient fine tuning in many different, in, in many different uh, avatars. And the claim is you can get away with tuning less than one parameter, 1% 1 of the parameters of a large language model. Uh, and this gets comparable accuracy or better versus tuning the for 100% of the parameters. You just have to find the right one parameter percent of the parameters to train and how to do it. Uh, some of the works that I'll mention, I'll, I'll mention like, uh, I'll get a bit more into this, but uh, adapters, some of you might be familiar with, a more recent work, Compactor, something called LoRa, uh, and these are just a few of note. And I, I'm actually, since I have some time, I'm going to tell you a bit uh, about some of these. So adapters were introduced by Hulsby et al. in 2019, and they're a type of way of essentially tuning far fewer parameters in a uh, transformer architecture. So you can see this is kind of an, uh, this, this right here is a transformer layer, uh, except with the addition of these uh, two things here, you can see these adapters, one after basically the feed forward layers. And uh, you can see what's inside the adapter layer. Uh, and everything in green here are things that you are going to uh, find, that are things that you're going to tune when you're at the fine tuning stage of uh, your uh, training model. So just to sort of say it again, what you're going to do uh, when using adapters is you're going to fee freeze the base model parameters except for the layer norm parameters. And you're going to add new adapter layers which contain far, far fewer uh, parameters than the overall network just after each attention and feed forward layer. And then yeah, you only tune a small number of new parameters. And it turns out that if you use these, you will also, you will get pretty much comparable accuracy to training all of the parameters, even though you're tuning a hundred times less roughly. And then there's another recent work by Mahabadi et al, uh, just from last year called Compactor, where you even make it even uh, more, uh, fewer parameters by uh, positing some low rank structure between, uh, which is shared between different adapters. And uh, yeah, you can see here that uh, this is this is from the Mahabadi et al paper, I think. And you can see just I, I just want to highlight one result. You can see that uh, you go from training 100% of uh, parameters to get 61.76 uh, on Cola, and you can go down to 0.1% or even point yeah yeah basically either 1% or 0.1% and getting better accuracy with adapter compactors. So it shows that uh, you can even improve the accuracy by using fewer parameters. And a very recent one, which uh, we actually found was uh, I'm, I'm skipping ahead of it, but we found this was pretty effective in the private setting, uh, a paper that was recently accepted at iClear 2022 by some other folks at Microsoft, which is uh, called LoRa. And the basic idea is fairly, is, is fairly simple and elegant in my opinion. Uh, you start with a dense, uh, just imagine you have some dense weight matrix of M, which is D by D. Uh, this is so D squared parameters on this, if you wanted to train it uh, fully. Now, However, you can assume that uh, what, what, you, what they do in LoRa is essentially reparameterize such a dense weight matrix, which has D squared parameters into a lower rank structure. So uh, you can see it here. I kind of write it as this decomposition of WPT plus A times B. And they have a picture here, this is from their paper. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to write our, uh, the ma weight matrix that we want to train, this, this sort of, uh, this is a, a matrix of parameters. We're going to start at a starting point with the pre-trained weights, which we're gonna freeze. And then A and B are going to be low rank matrices, which are trainable. And so you can see the A is gonna be D by R and B is going to be R by D. And we're going to choose R to be some small amount, some small number to make sure that this product A times B is low rank. And as a result, if you assume it to be relatively low rank, then you're going to save a factor of roughly D compared to uh, the dense matrix. So you can see from D squared, we become 2RD, which in R16, that becomes 32D. So yeah, uh, don't, don't focus too much on the details here because it's not going to be too, too important. But the point is that I've told you about adapters, compactors, LoRa, all of these methods, which allow you to significantly sparsify the networks in terms of the number of trainable parameters, which preserves or even improves the accuracy. And I, I wanna sort of phrase this as a type of uh, bigger picture. This is not really our contribution in any sense, but like this is kind of a helpful abstraction in which to think of uh, any sort of, uh, any sort of uh, fine tuning method, which is parameter efficient. So we imagine that there is uh, some pre-trained model where WPT is the pre-trained weights and X is an input. 
And we're going to imagine that we look at fine-tuned models which take the form uh, where it takes in the pre-trained weights uh, and the input x, but also some new parameters where the dimension is much, much smaller than uh, the dimension of the pre-trained weights. And this encompasses all of the above methods that I mentioned, as well as probably more, which I haven't mentioned, including, say, prefix tuning, prompt tuning, uh, plug and play language models, and so on. Yeah, uh, again, this is nothing, this is just, a, I think, a useful perspective to uh, look at it through. The idea is that we want to fine tune far fewer weights than the overall model has. And so, with this in mind, let me finally say, sort of, sort of tell you about the framework which you should think of our. Uh, of how we uh, run some of these experiments, we can picture it as a three-phase process. The first phase is going to be uh, pre-training, and you can see this is this is exactly the same as before, as you might be familiar with, where we have some large public data set. We use a non-private optimizer to train a large language model, and all of this is visible to an adversary who's trying to cause a privacy violation to happen. This is just as normal. Now, the perhaps uh, interesting part, or the the things change a bit when you do uh, fine tuning. In a sense, you take your pre-trained parameters, but then inside this box, which we assume is not visible to the adversary, what we're going to do is we're going to take our smaller sensitive private data set, and we're going to use a private optimizer such as DPSGD, like I mentioned. And we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to leave the pre-trained parameters unchanged, but we're going to fine tune some new parameters, which are going to be say much, much smaller or lower in dimensionality, than the overall parameters of the model. And then the idea is after we finish fine tuning these privately, then we can take it out of this box, which is not visible to the adversary. There's a nice property of differential privacy that says, uh, you know, once something is private, you can do whatever you want with it and it's not gonna lose any more privacy. So you can take it out and then plug it in, essentially uh, taking your original pre-trained model and just putting in these, these fine tuned parameters with privacy. Uh, and in particular, similar to adapters and all these other uh, approaches, uh, you, can, you can swap between them in a fairly lightweight way, which could be helpful for deployments, particularly in, say, federated learning or something. Okay, before, uh, I'm pretty much, uh, the, after this, I'm just going to tell you about results uh, and how well this works, but uh, I'm going to pause here once again for questions about the general framework uh, in case anything's less clear. I'll pause for an awkwardly long time. I mean, I have a question, which is yeah. a little naive because I haven't ever, I, I, I don't know this area very well, but like in, if you didn't care about privacy, do people, when people fine tune, do they usually use less parameters just because they know they need less or do they usually just kind of like use all the parameters? Cause why not? Like, is that, yeah. I, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great question. Like, um, yeah, so these these methods that I mentioned, like adapters and uh, Pactor, Laura, these things were introduced for the non-private setting, uh, and kind of for somewhat similar reasons as, uh, you know, I've I've sort of alluded to in the sense that first of all, uh, it it seems to sometimes give better accuracy, but also it's much more lightweight to train on, say, one percent of the parameters rather than a hundred percent of the parameters, particularly on like uh things like, for example, uh, GPT three, where like I think, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to quote specific numbers, but uh, okay, I'm not going to go back to Laura. But yeah, Laura is by Microsoft folks, who are some of the few folks who have uh, access to GPT-3 and can uh, train it. But like I've heard that fine tuning it, like full fine tuning of it, is a massive like, like ordeal with you know tens and tens of GPUs, maybe even hundreds of GPUs, just to fine tune it, not even pre-train it. Um, whereas you can do like it takes far fewer GPUs on uh, uh, on using say Laura. So efficiency things like that also are useful in the non-private setting. Uh, there is a question. Uh, does the DP tuning step require any public data asked by Joe? And uh, no, that's that's the sort of uh, convenient thing that this this uh, once we do the fine tuning, or sorry, once you do the pre-training on public data, then we don't require any more uh, any more public data during the fine tuning step. So I think that's what's kind of nice. Of course, you could also assume that you do have some public data during the fine tuning step. And then maybe you can also do even better, but uh, we'll see that uh, you can actually do pretty well even with just this private data set. Great questions. Uh, yeah, let, let me note that uh, sort of as on, on the topic while we're talking about that, 
I'll say that there's a number of papers which also look at, you know, where to use public data and when and what sort of advantages. And I'll, I'll revisit this again at the end of the talk, but it's a, it's a very exciting research direction, I think. Cool. Before I continue, any other questions? Yeah, I have one follow-up question. Um, for sure. So here you introduced this private um, optimizer, which will, um, let's say, guarantee, or, or does it guarantee the privacy as you um, defined at the beginning of the talk, or? Um... Correct, yes, uh, exactly, yes. So what it will do, what the guarantees will have are that uh, it will be private with respect to the small private, the fine tuning data set. It won't be private with respect to the public data set. That'll be sort of uh, have no privacy guarantees, but we will have the strong privacy guarantee that I mentioned for anything in your fine tuning data set. I see. And... Say, e.g. the MNLI data set, training set, for example, just to pick one. Which is, of course, maybe a toy example, but you can picture whatever other language task you want to fine-tune on. Makes sense. Um, I think in the definition equation, there is some epsilon. It just at, at a glance, it seems that the, uh, it's a hyperparameter that can be tuned to control the level of privacy. Is that correct? Right, yeah. I, I guess I, I, I different people use diff hyperparameter mean different things, but I guess I would consider it a parameter rather than a hyperparameter in the sense that, yeah, like kind of when you're, when you're designing your model or you're picking how to deploy it, then you pick, okay, how much privacy do I want to guarantee? That's sort of like a policy type question. And then based on that, you can think, okay, this level of epsilon is appropriate. And we're going to say that we can guarantee epsilon equals say like four or something. Uh, and then you feed that in and then it'll do the best it can do with that prescribed amount of uh, privacy. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, what you said makes sense. Although I, cool. I have another question related yeah. to that. So um, let's say we set the, uh, parameter to be four, um, four level of privacy. And what's the semantic meaning of that? And that That is a very good question. Yeah, I think this is, it's, it's kind of like, I think there's canonically been a bit of a challenge in terms of how do you exactly translate between what an epsilon value is and, you know, what is, what do, you, what do the policymakers say? Like, oh, I mean, you know, I can tell you the privacy loss random variable uh, has a, you know, I can tell you some properties of that, but that's hard to trans, uh, like translate into a policy prescription. So I, I think that's a bit beyond the scope of this talk in terms of like what I can explain in short notice. But uh, I think, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe Joe can, I think Joe's done some work in this as well, who's also in the talk. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's, that's a good area, question and a big area of research, I think right now, how to, you know, connect those two dots. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Cool. Great questions. Uh, anyone else? Uh, another one in chat. Yeah, Joe agrees that it's a, a hard question and an interesting research question, I guess. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, okay, now let me tell you the findings. Uh, I've uh, built up to this over so long. So, and the sort of uh, the the first finding, which I think is the biggest thing, is the fact that large language models can be fine-tuned uh, privately. So here is the plot of our findings, our table of our findings. This is on Roberta Large with epsilon equals 6.7. Uh, and you can see here that what we have in the first row is full fine tuning without differential privacy. Uh, and you can see these are, I think these are taken from maybe the Roberta paper. Uh, and you can see that uh, you get like 90%, uh, 96%, 92%, et cetera. And at the same time, you can see that on LoRa, using LoRa and differentially private fine tuning, then you can get accuracy 87.8, 95.3, 87.4, et cetera. So like in, in broadly speaking, in terms of the average uh, accuracy loss, it's a 3% average drop from non-private to private. Now, I just wanna oh. emphasize that. I think that's comparatively very, very good in the sense that, remember when I showed you CIFAR 10, we had a 30%, uh, 30 basis point drop in terms of uh, or not basic point, yeah, 30 percentage points drop uh, from non-private to private. So 3% is actually a fairly mild drop in utility. And again, I'll also mention that this only tunes 1% of the parameters per task, which I think is nice for a number of reasons uh, in terms of including portability and stuff. Uh, hey, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, for sure. You, done, you could have also compared training with Laura without differential privacy, right? Yeah, yeah, and some of the other things we do that as well. I think it maybe I think it maybe ups these numbers a little bit. Maybe it may takes it up to ninety one or ninety two. Not not anything super dramatic, 
at least the qualitative behavior from like uh, non-private fine tuning without yeah non-private fine tuning via any method is kind of like to sorry let me let me say if you take the best non-private method fine tuning to the best private method fine tuning it's not like that huge a drop like three percent five percent or something okay yeah actually i was thinking the opposite i thought maybe laura dropped it a little bit and then dp dropped it a little more but you're just saying maybe laura was even better than the baselines yeah yeah it could, I, I don't actually remember off the top of my head yeah, whether it's better yeah. or worse but even let's say it is better it's not gonna be super a huge amount better and uh yeah it's still a small drop cool thanks so yeah uh good question so again, we only tune 1% of the parameters per task. Maybe this parameter efficiency is what helps us. And I'm going to take a little bit of a divert, not, not really diversion here, but uh, discuss this a little bit more. Like, does the parameter efficiency really mean something important? I kind of harked on this, like, oh yeah, maybe we're only training a few parameters that, that, that makes things nice in terms of accuracy. Uh, and sorry, my slide isn't advancing. So I'll mention a, a concurrent work, which is due to Lee, Tremere, Liang, and Hashimoto, which was also submitted and accepted to iClear 2022. And the interesting thing is that they found that private accuracy is not due to parameter efficiency. In particular, uh, here's the same table I just showed you. And then they show full fine tuning on the same Roberto Large. It's actually uncanny how these were independent works, but they did like the exact same experiments as we did. It's, it's really interesting. Um, and you can see that they did, uh, full fine tuning on Roberta Large, and they showed pretty comparable uh, scores as we did using LoRa. So you can compare, say, QQP, we got 87.4, they got 87.49. QNLI, we got 90.8, they got 89.42. Like these, these numbers match almost exactly, even without using LoRa, compactor, adapter, et cetera. Um, yeah, it turns out that what the issue was, like if, if you saw our, I think in our table, we had like a full fine tuning with privacy. And we got something like 50 or 60% actually. So we were thought thinking it doesn't work, but it seems to be some sort of precision issues. I guess we've, since, since I made these slides, we sort of figured it out. Uh, it seems to be something with uh, involving full precision versus a uh, half precision. So it's surprising, but these things apparently cause issues during DP training, which is another challenge. I'm happy to talk more about this offline. But so yeah, this is, I thought this was pretty interesting that uh, the private accuracy improvement uh, or the private accuracy performance was not due to this parameter efficiency seen here the sense that full fine tuning still works. But I'll mention also that still there are other advantages to why you might only want to train 1% of your parameters due to like portability. Uh, I'll mention we also did this for NLG tasks on uh, like natural language generation tasks on GPT-2. And you can see similar types of, uh, types of uh, trends in the sense that, uh, you know, in the, on this table, uh, what is it? Generally, lower lower scores are better for this column, whereas higher scores are better for the other columns. So you can see here at the uh, at, for the bottom few rows. Uh, sorry, this is the E2E uh, task. Uh, the bottom few rows. These are the non-private settings, and these are, up here are the private settings. And you can see it's not that dramatic a difference, especially if you consider the larger models. So yeah, I'll leave this up for for the you know NLG fans in the audience to just uh, take in the results. I won't comment too much more on it. The, before I move on to the next finding, where the next finding is actually that bigger models are better. So again, this is not surprising to those folks if you do non-private language modeling, but given this parameter efficiency thing, then I thought it was pretty surprising when I found out about it in the sense that, uh, let's take a look here. So what we have at the top is Roberta base, which is smaller than Roberta large. So the bottom one is a larger model. You can see, as many of you might be familiar with, the first row is the non-private accuracy. You can see that MNLI, say, jumps from 87.6 to 90.2 uh, without privacy. But perhaps the surprising thing is the fact that uh, MNLI uh, under DP, with, say, LoRa, this improves from 83.5 uh, in Roberta base to 87.8 uh, on Roberta large. And this is kind of across the board, we see this type of improvement. And similar things happen also for NLG tasks. Um, yeah, this is blue score. I think this might be, this, this is dark actually on this bottom one. But okay, there's a lot of numbers. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna like walk you through all of these, but there's like two takeaways that maybe you should have when staring at this. First of all, the bigger models are better in, the, the first reason that bigger models are better is first because the absolute numbers are bigger in the sense that say 83.5 goes to 87.8, but also, the other interesting thing is there's less drop due to privacy in terms of the uh, accuracy loss between um, 
non-private and private. So you can see here, just, just to highlight, um, uh, what do I want to look at? Yeah, let's, let's just look at these because I don't have to do math in my head now. You can see if you look at GPT-2 medium, then the drop between private and non-private is 5.1 points. Whereas if you look at GPT-2 XL, then the drop due to privacy is only 4.3 points. So somehow making a larger model actually makes it preserve its non-private uh, utility better, which I think is rather interesting and surprising. Uh, yeah, and then the third finding is that these things are faster and more memory efficient. This is kind of like a tertiary finding, uh, so I'm not going to harp on this too much, but kind of, you know, the seconds per epoch for doing DP LoRa versus full fine tuning is like a factor of three better, the memory is a factor of four better on, uh, I actually don't remember exactly the experiment settings, but I just want to sort of at least mention that, yeah, these are kind of the non-private advantages of parameter efficient things. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much everything I want to talk about in terms of like specifics of our findings uh, and results. I'm going to take it for the last like two or three slides, I'm going to take it more big picture. And hopefully what I want you to take away from like uh, what, what else is interesting in private data analysis. And like I mentioned a few times through this talk, I think the bigger picture is that public data can surmount the deficiencies of private data analysis. And this has been shown by now a couple of times, but I think there's a lot more work to do. And this is the, the metaphor I like to say, that private NLP without using public data is like pretending that the English language itself is private information, right? Imagine you've given some data set uh, which, uh, which you want to do some private task on privately. If you don't start with any sort of fine to, uh, with, sorry, if you don't start with any sort of public data, then you're kind of saying that everything about the data set, including you know, the language, the syntax, everything is private. But that's not true because uh, and we, we don't consider generally the English language to be uh, sensitive in terms of uh, privacy. So you can think of it as two stages where public pre-training is like learning English, whereas private fine tuning on say a medical like diagnosis data set is learning how to diagnose from text of symptoms. The first one is not really a sensitive task, whereas the second, latter, latter one could be a sensitive task. So I think using public data as a starting point is kind of indispensable. And I, I personally hope and think that this will be, you know, five, 10 years from now, the future of private data analysis. Uh, because it seems that in, in our case, we found that public data can dramatically improve the accuracy in private ML. This is also true for vision tasks. For example, this is also from this excellent paper I mentioned of Tremere and Bonnet, where they showed that, remember I told you, you can only get 69% on CIFAR 10. Well, if you assume that you have CIFAR 100 as a public data set, this jumps to 80%. And if you assume that you have an unlabeled version of ImageNet as a public data set, uh, then you can get all the way up to 93%. And this might actually be a pretty reasonable assumption to make that you have an unlimited ImageNet, uh, sorry, unlabeled ImageNet, because you can imagine that before you do any sort of image vision task, you could just go on, say, Flickr and download every possible image you can possibly find uh, and you know, train on that. So um, that will, that will help you essentially learn the, the to go back to this metaphor it would be like learning what a picture generally looks like and then uh and yeah what, what a picture generally looks like so i think that's one thing i want you to take away that this is a very underexplored area and i think it personally i personally think it's the future of private data analysis using public data in the appropriate way um the other thing i want to leave you with is the open question of why uh in the sense I used to tell everyone, I used to think more parameters means more noise equals worse accuracy. Actually, the other paper I mentioned, this uh, one by Lee et al., uh, they cite my lecture notes for saying that, uh, you know, the, <laughs> this misconception exists. And I'll, I'll own it. I used to think that I used to tell everyone that uh, because it seemed to be true. But it seems like larger language models do better, even with full fine tuning. And I, I don't know why this is right now. Uh, I don't understand it. And I don't think anyone understands it. So that's a big open question. Um, one, one kind of, uh, uh, hypothesis, I'll, which is a little bit uh, edgy, is saying maybe maybe large language models are actually small. To go back to this picture I showed you before, maybe you know this GPT three, uh, the biggest possible model. Maybe that's just on this upslope here that we haven't gotten to this you know whatever ten filter CNN yet in terms of uh, performance. So maybe we maybe you know one trillion parameters or uh, you know one quadrillion parameters is when we'll start seeing diminishing returns. But who knows? Uh, yeah, the style of architecture also seems to matter in the sense that handcrafted features can be better than uh, deep networks, according to this, again, work by Tremor and Bonnet. 
I have some guesses, uh, but I'm still thinking about this. And I think this is the main scientific takeaway of our work, which is more a question, not really an answer. So I'll conclude now. Um, in conclusion, it seems like large language models can be fine trained privately and the utility is actually really good. Like again, that 69% on uh, CIFAR 10, that's not usable in, in my opinion, but I think the type of accuracy you get out of these large language models with privacy is actually usable in many cases. And I hope that uh, you know people will take this away that the uh, downside of private ML can be overcome even with the power of public data. And the question is sort of where else can this be uh, the case? So yeah, thank you all for your attention, all for coming, a number of excellent questions and I'm happy to take questions. In particular, we can start with questions in the uh, chat. Uh, so the first question is by Kalpesh, which asks, do you have experiments to show these models are actually private besides the epsilon guarantee? Like, are these models less vulnerable to attacks like membership inference, adversarial triggers like Wallace et al., backdoors, or the Carlini training data extraction attacks? Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. I guess we personally have not uh, run uh, these models, but the, the sort of convenient thing, uh, sorry, we have not run attacks against these models, but the convenient thing is, first of all, with differential privacy, it's kind of a rigorous guarantee that uh, you can always translate from a DP guarantee to a type of membership inference uh, guarantee. But the interesting thing is often these, uh, these what, what do I wanna say, these DP guarantees that you get, they're often conservative in the sense that maybe they predict, okay, uh, this says that you have no more than a 20% chance of re-identifying some individual. But in practice, it seems like the amount is maybe more like 1% just to throw out some random numbers. So I think it is a very interesting question to show that these models are even more private than kind of what the differential privacy prescribes. We haven't done them specifically, but I think that's cool to explore. Uh, and then the next question by Joe is, uh, do large models still do better if you start from scratch, uh, no pre-training on public data? That's a good question. And I, I don't personally know the answer. Like I mentioned, there is a paper by Anil et al where they do private fine to, oh, sorry, private pre-training of BERT from scratch. Uh, and I, I know that their focus is doing it on BERT large. Uh, I'm not sure if they investigated uh, BERT base or BERT small or anything. Uh, so yeah, I can't, I, I can't answer that question, but I would hope that the, I, I would, it would be cool if the answer was in that uh, paper. I'll check it out uh, and uh, we can talk about that maybe more later during our meeting. Right, okay, there's another question from Vasanta Chaganti. And uh, the question is, you've shown results where epsilon is around four, if I understand correctly. However, most DP literature recommends an epsilon between zero and one. How do you reconcile this? So yeah, that's good. Uh, first of all, let, let me say that for like private machine learning works, it seems that the general rule of thumb that I tell people is that, you know, epsilon less than 10 is kind of uh, uh, like, okay. Uh, it's it's not, not okay, maybe. It's ki kind of common. Uh, yeah, it, it's common, I'd say. Uh, and anything above 10 is when you should start becoming very, very skeptical. Uh, and it is true that, say, best practices maybe prefer an epsilon between zero and one. But the thing is, uh, like, okay, if you literally look at what uh, differential privacy, like epsilon delta differential privacy prescribes, it might seem that like epsilon equals six or eight or something might look really bad, like in terms of uh, you'd, you'd have a huge risk of violation. But the convenient thing of it is that DPSGD satisfies, this is getting a bit technical, I'll, I'll just warn about that. DPSGD actually satisfies a stronger privacy guarantee uh, than epsilon delta differential privacy. It actually satisfies something known as Renyi DP, which let me, let me say, uh, well, the best way to maybe get this across is the idea that the risk of bad events happening kind of decays quickly. So like, even if you have a, a whatever value of epsilon, which may seem like relatively large, it turns out that, you know, the probability of having uh, the, a very bad event happen is still relatively small based on the way the tail that this work. Sorry, I, it, it's kind of hard to answer this question without getting a little bit technical, but yeah, I, I guess, let me just say that you're correct that if you literally look at epsilon differential privacy, then it's very scary if you picture it like that. But um, but uh, the thing is massive like failures, like the Delta probability event happening or something like that, those, those won't really, uh, yeah, those, those won't uh, be as harmful as uh, it seems from just that definition if you appeal instead to Ren EDP. 
do you have any plot showing the epsilon versus utility trade-off for glue tasks? Uh, yeah, in, in the paper, we have uh, some, uh, some tables showing like epsilon equals, I think we go as low as maybe two. Uh, and it still shows like reasonably good performance. Like we don't, I don't think we, I'm not sure if we ran it uh, small enough to really get the disastrous uh, accuracy at this point, but it it's at, it supports relatively small uh, epsilon. Cool. Any other questions? I know you're over time, but I have a quick question. Um... It's, is it correct that there should be counterintuitive? Like I would think on the, on the pre-training part, you have a ton of data. In theory, it would be easy to train dif differentially privately. But what you're saying is basically it's hard to train the first pre-training part differentially privately and it's easier to train the fine tuning part differentially privately. And I would have thought the opposite. Like, is that correct intuition? Yeah, that's, that's a good <laughs> point. Uh, that, that's a fair point. Like in the sense that, you know, you have just to sort of, repeat the key points, the, fir the first training data set is much, the pre-training data set is much, much larger than the fine tuning data set. So maybe that makes it easier. I guess I would say the fact that, uh, you know, in the original problem, you're starting with the entire space of parameters. You could go from literally any possible parameter setting. Whereas when you're doing the fine tuning, you're kind of already like 99% of the way there, maybe. Uh, so that that might be like one intuition as why it's uh, easier. Yeah, I'll mention that maybe the like the, this isn't really a question, I guess, but uh, I'll mention another thing which is interesting is that in the future, uh, it might be possible to do perfectly private uh, language modeling in the sense that zero shot learning has become popular recently. Uh, in, in it, or it's shown that in some cases, maybe zero shot learning does okay things where essentially you don't even have a fine tuning data set. Like you can ask GPT three things and essentially, yeah, you can get epsilon equals zero equals perfect differential privacy because you don't even need a sensitive data set. I'm not sure why your question reminded me of that, but uh, I was, so oh, thanks, Dave. Yeah. Yes, uh, there's another question from Akanksha asking, do you have any sense of how differential privacy impacts biased or imbalanced data? Uh, I guess uh, I, I, I'm not fully sure about the question. I think my interpretation is maybe this is alluding to the fact, fact that often differential privacy has disparate impacts on things like fairness. Um, and yeah, that, that's a problem, but I, I, my, I was, this is a good question, something I've been thinking about a bit. I haven't really done too much in earnest yet, but I think this is kind this kind of phenomenon where uh, it has a disparate impact on maybe minority subgroups is kind of an unavoidable part of a technical privacy definition in the sense that say you have a population with say 10 people and a population with say a million people, then the impact of removing one person from that set of 10 people uh, would have much more, it, it would lose a lot more information than losing one person from a set of say a million people. So I, I think that yes, it does cause fairness, uh, uh, fairness, uh, like, uh, sorry, disproportionate impact on fairness, but I think this is really inherent to any sort of privacy preserving method, just because of what privacy is trying to preserve. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Feel free to clarify if you were asking something different. Yeah, that, that was it. That's what I was asking. Cool. Um, yeah, because yeah. my intuition was also that um, same thing, that if it will have a, they don't go hand in hand, essentially. Right, yeah. And I think that's sort of with any privacy thing. That, that's something I'm thinking about a little bit to see if we can really, you know, I, I think that's, you know, a thought that a lot of people have, but it's not, it's not differential privacy at any privacy in my mind. I see. Cool, thanks. Thanks for the question. Cool, uh, there's something else in chat. Uh, yeah, Kalpesh is the same, thank you. Yeah, um, so any last minute questions? Yeah, otherwise uh, um, let's thank uh, Professor Kamas for the wonderful talk and uh, a lot of insights, um, definitely learned a lot. Um, Let's see, I think we have three one-to-one -one meetings starting 1.30. Yeah, um, if anyone else wants to meet afterwards or wants to chat or something, I'm happy to chat anytime between three and four o'clock. You can just uh, email me and happy to talk. Yeah. And let's all unmute ourselves and give uh, Gotham a round of applause. Thank you.
Cool. Yeah, again, thank you so much for being here. I know there's a lot of uh, demands on your attention. I appreciate so many of you coming and asking fantastic questions. So thanks.